I really want to give you a slightly, a slightly different take on um, plant blindness and, and that, that, that how we perceive plants um, through a, a different window. Um, before I get to that, I'd just like to echo a lot of the things that have already been said, really. I mean, Jonathan's take on online teaching um, of uh, plants um, at university level, that <laughs> strong resonances with me. Um, I run the plant degree at Nottingham University. So um, those students are the, the, the very small group who I don't have to break through the, the, the plant blindness barrier with, they're already on board. However, I do teach 300 odd biology students who we have to work quite hard with to get across um, a perception barrier. And also I teach agriculture and biotech students, we're talking about biotechnology students um, who can see that plants are useful, so it's a utility point of view, but again getting them on board with sort of the wider picture can be a challenge. So um, that's where I come from from a, from a teaching perspective. I've also done a, quite a lot of outreach work over the years in various different media. Um, however, um, <laughs> my, my heart is in the Mesozoic era. Um, my background is in paleobotany, the study of fossil plants. Um, so what I want to talk to you today about is um, very much that side of the story. Um, is there um, a similar problem in what we can say about how people understand about plants in the past? Um, and, and, and spoiler, yes, there is. Um, but also, could that tell us things about how better to communicate um, about plants and, and get people's interests? and keep people on board when we communicate about plants more broadly? Are there some lessons we could learn from this through deep time and also through um, a historical sort of look at this as well? Okay, so crashing on. So um, first question, and I've already given you the spoiler for this one. Um, is plant blindness at play in paleontology? And I would strongly argue, um, yes, it is. Um, is it relevant to my particular area, which is how we communicate about this, whether that's formal teaching or whether that's informal um, science communication? Um, should we care anyway? And, and we can argue that point. Um, but can we ameliorate the effects of plant blindness when we talk about um, plant life through deep time? So <laughs> um, we've been talking about the plants that we can go and see in our media environment. We've been talking about how we can actually get people to engage with um, their neighbourhood plants, thinking about landscape, thinking about environment, um, whether that's urban or whether that's people who are lucky enough to live somewhere where they can go and see some, some natural biodiversity. Um, I think you'll agree with the best will in the world that the, the plants that I, I, I try and I'm passionate about and want to explain to people um, are, are less immediate than modern plants. Um, so and, and again when Steph mentioned um, uh, the Natural History Museum and, and, and she touched on fossils a little bit so top right on this slide you've got some of the, the fossil tree trunks, some woody, some otherwise um, plant tr tree trunks through time is what I like to think of that display in the Natural History um, main gallery. Um, plant fossils are fragmentary. Um, plants get preserved usually as individual organs or parts of organs. So some of these, you've got two fossils here where you, I think, I think you would probably agree that they, they look like leaves, they're impressions of leaves. Um, fragmentary material, you've got some fossils which are um, well, petrifactions, where something has been preserved and you've got really good preservation um, but in order to explain why it's really good and why it's really interesting and what it can tell you about plant evolution, um, you have to unpack so much to get there. So that coal ball in the middle top row or the, the, the unexciting possibly um, chunk of rock in the bottom row there, that, that, that chunk of rhiny chert. So that's from the earliest, one of the earliest land ecosystems and it will tell us a great deal. But there is a whole bunch of stuff I have to unpack in order to get someone on board with looking at that rock. There are, and, and, and I appreciate that the people in this audience are probably people who would be 
you know, easy, easy to persuade early adopters, I'd be able to say, okay, I can, I can explain that what you're looking here is a, a cross section through a stem, do that whole bit and, and you would be on board. But for, for wider audiences, um, this is a bit of a challenge. Fragmentary material of organisms that they are not naturally inclined to, to warm to in the same way that they will um, other organisms, which I will, I will talk about in a minute. Um, so that's what we're dealing with. Fragmentary material scattered through time, difficult to get people on board in the same, exactly the same way as, as modern plants, it's difficult to persuade people. Um, fossil plants, same problem, intensified a bit, I would argue. So, <laughs> I'm sorry to bring um, zoology into this, I really am. However, this is, this is me trying to make a point. Um, reconstructions in paleontology are so important for getting our message across because we have this fragmentary material and in order to bring it to life we we can't take a photo but we can't take people into the field i wish we could uh, we our best way of doing that our proxy is to produce paleo reconstructions and um, this is every this is my favorite subgenre of paleo reconstruction this is T-Rex looking over his shoulder as the meteorite strikes at the end of the Cretaceous. Okay, and it's, it's, it's a rich scene of paleo art. I think you'll agree. Um, <laughs> yes, it's a bit silly, um, but it exemplifies um, the reinforcing nature, the self-reinforcing nature of, of paleo reconstructions. Um, that, that you end up with 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 sort of uh, today you'd call them memes, easy shorthands for a particular snapshot of time, and with the end Cretaceous um, extinction events, um, this is the the hugely reinforced meme that you end up with. Um, uh, you may be able to see on some of those you you've got some greenery, um, sort of fairly nondescript vegetation, I would say, and some of them you've still got that that. Um, classic, um, we find dinosaurs in rocks, therefore they, they must walk around in, in a rocky landscape kind of uh, approach. I'll come back to that in a minute. So reconstructions are very important for how people perceive life in the past, is my point. However, this is the story I wish to tell. This is the, the, the big story that I tell my second year students in, in the course that I run about plant life through time. It's the story that I try and give all of my undergraduate students, whichever degree they're on, at least I want them to have an overview. Um, so to orientate yourself, and I'm sorry to stick a graph at you in this talk. Um, this is plant diversity through time. So along the bottom, you've got now is on the right. You've got 444 or thereabouts million years ago is on the left on that bottom scale. And what you've got there is the name of the geological periods. Again, you're sort of a hopefully fairly warm to natural history and, and, and understanding the natural world. So I'm hopeful that a few of you, these names, Jurassic, Cretaceous, will be familiar to you. Um, so we're, we're working through time from left to right and up the side we've got the number of plant families um, so we've got a measure of diversity and we can divide that time and the way that globally everybody on the planet has agreed we could divide that time we talk about geological eras paleozoic mesozoic cenozoic and of course the zoic bit of that <laughs> that's that's animals we define geological history by the appearance and disappearance of particular marine, usually animals. It's already, there's this inherent <laughs> bias in the way that we describe um, life through deep time. It's, it's all about, it's all about the animals. Um, so other workers have proposed that, 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 that rather than talking about the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, when we're talking about plants and their evolution through time, um, we should instead talk about the Paleophytic, the Mesophytic, the Cenophytic. And actually, again, if I showed you the graph that most 
first year paleontology um, undergraduates would be faced with, with the, the, the big five extinctions events that we can see in the fossil record through deep time. Um, and you may be aware that we talk about the, the present extinction um, crisis as the, the sixth possible mass extinction. Um, what hopefully strikes you from this graph is that um, you can see that the, the biggest of those mass extinctions, which happened at the end of the Permian, um, so the end of the Paleozoic era, it, yes, that's dented plant diversity, but actually the story of plants through time isn't that catastrophic um, story of, of big extinction events. We're telling a different story here and, and, it, and in this graph, um, and th this is from a paper by Chris Cleal and um, uh, Borga um, Cascales Mignana. Um, this story is, is one of a resilience and a story of um, persistence over deep time. Um, and it's also a story about a huge, huge change um, about 120 million years ago um, that transformed our planet. And you can see on the graph, you've got the appearance of the angiosperms. And again, getting across that, just because the planet works this way now, it doesn't, yeah, 100 million years ago, go back that far and, and you have a radically different planet. So when we're thinking on deep time scales and we're trying to understand issues like climate change over that really big scale of millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years. It's just really important to have that overview. OK, so that, that's me ranting a little bit <laughs> about the story that I wish to tell. And the, that's the, that's the biggest version of it. So um, how does that get communicated? Back to paleo reconstructions. So the earliest um, everyone's more or less agreed that the earliest paleontological reconstruction was Duria Antiquior, and this was produced by Henry Della Beach in 1830. And hopefully some of you will recognise that little bit of artwork there. Um, if we were in a, a meeting together in a room, I would, I would, I would urge you all to, to have a vote on whether you think there would be any plants in this picture. Obviously we're not in a room together so I can't do that. So have a little think. Do you think this famous first bit of paleo art with that um, plesiosaur being mercilessly attacked there, do you think there are plants in it? Those of you who said yes were correct. If you look on the bits of, of the land masses sticking out in this plant, in this reconstruction, you can see that yes, there are plants already in the mix. Even though paleontology was, was young and fresh, and even though this is the very first bit of paleo art, plants were being included. Um, they knew about plant fossils. They, they, they knew that it was important. Yes, the, I'm, I'm not, the, the nondescript nature of <laughs> the, 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 the plant in the foreground on the left is, is, is quite interesting. And interestingly, if you go from this, which was, Henry Della Beach's original watercolour, it then got mass produced as a lithograph. And by the time you get through to Georg um, Schaaf's lithograph version, um, those um, nondescript plant stems have become some, some more palm trees. So there's already been a change there. My point being that from the earliest reconstructions of life through deep time, um, plants were in the mix and they weren't being missed off um, um, and, and this in, in part reflects the way that naturalists and natural history um, was inclusive of plants in, in a much more sort of broad, broad sense as well. So, skip forward in time, um, 20th century and, and, and <laughs> This is me indulging myself a little bit with this slide because actually, um, uh, and, and this dates me com completely because this is, is one of my one of the books that I had when I was a child. Um, but this is what we end up with: the the the, the shorthand, those the the the, the way that we um, 
picture uh, life in the past um, has been established as the, 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 the model. Plants are the backdrop and tetrapods, whether that's these dinosaurs, in this case herbivorous dinosaurs, um, they're, they're the actors. So that's what paleo art has become by the 20th century. That's the, the convention. That's the word I'm looking for. The convention is that dinosaurs usually, but not exclusively, are the actors and plants are passive, um, coloured in a little bit. Some of them might actually have a little bit of um, attention paid to them and different artists, of course, would, would approach that differently. Um, but again, to revisit that whole, um, to have these huge animals, um, proper ecosystems, to think that they're walking around on bare earth and that it's not the, the plant biomass that is sustaining this whole ecosystem is, is, is crazy. And yet um, the convention persists. Dinosaurs walk around on bare rocks. Um, so that's what we had um, until the 1990s. And in the 1990s, we got Jurassic Park. <laughs> we got Walking with Dinosaurs. We got CGI, basically, which changed, again, that whole being able to perceive what a fossil um, is telling you and it to look like it's alive. People had done things before and people like um, the animations, the, the stop motion animations of Harryhausen and things like that had in some way brought paleontology to life. But actually, it was CGI that made the difference. And, and certainly my kids have grown up in a world where um, uh, the means of it, they can see it because they've grown up with seeing it on a screen. Um, and of course, Jurassic Park is important because it's one of the few um, popular um, representations for a paleobotanist, Ellie Sattler, um, respect. Um, <laughs> And with Walking with Dinosaurs, you had a much more academic approach to it. Um, the plants were well considered, I think, but again, the tetrapods, the animals are the actors and the plants are very much the backdrop again. So, so, so there was a, a step change which vastly um, improved representation for paleozoology, I would argue. And paleobotany was still along for the ride, but very much as a backdrop. So can we take any lessons from, from how these things were handled um, in human past? So rather than deep time, let's look at, at shallow time. Let's look at um, the last 200 years or so um, of our history. And almost unique to the UK, not exclusively, but mostly in the UK, um, we can look back to uh, fe fern fever, pteridomania in the 1850s, um, all the way through almost to the end of the 19th century. So, and, and, and again, I, I know there will be people in the audience who are very familiar with this idea, but just to give you a taste of it, um, in the same way that people today who've been in lockdown have really connected with their local um, local wildlife, their local biodiversity. Um, in the 19th century, people went a bit crazy for ferns. <laughs> and it, it does sound odd when you put it like that, but they really did. And people went out and collected ferns. There was, um, it, it was a hobby. You shared your ferns. It was the equivalent of Pokemon Go, <laughs> but for plants. Um, collectors did crazy, stupid things. Um, going up, up hillsides and, and, and fell and killed themselves. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's reflected in things like architecture and in, 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 in things like, um, if, you, if you see the, 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 the raw iron um, garden furniture, which has lovely flourishes of fern um, fronds in it, that, that's where all that comes from. Um, so there was a little window of time there where people were really interested in spore producing plants. They talked about ferns quite broadly. So they included things like club mosses, things like horsetails that in this whole kind of passion for a particular group of plants. Um, this coincided with human 
use of coal, which was revolutionizing society. So at the same time as people are going a bit crazy for living plants that they can go out and find in their environment, they are also actually aware that the material that is powering the, the, the huge changes and, and also the economic balance within their world comes from these spore producing plants. Um, and this confluence meant that, that, that um, uh, and uh, Naomi Yuval Nye um, captures this brilliantly in a paper that she wrote about it. And she calls this the botanization of coal. So for, for, and people handled coal all the time. They saw it being um, uh, delivered. They, it was everywhere. Um, it was a very tangible thing. So relating what you could see in those coal measures fossils, because you would frequently find fossils in it, relating that to modern plants um, happened as a matter of course. People were aware of it um, and people wanted to spread the word in the same way that I am desperate for people to understand that big picture of plants through time. So too were the, um, the naturalists of the day. If you look at the paleo illustrations from those times, if you look at things like this from Fossils of Germany by August Goldfuss um, and this lithograph by Christian Hur, um, look at the, the, the detail and I'm sorry it's, 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 it's a poor scan, um, but the detail on the trunks of those big club moss trees. Um, there are some animal life there down in the, the bottom right corner, but but it's 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 like a, a love letter to those plants. Is what I feel from that that lithograph. It's really sort of all about the plants, um, and it's not apologetic about it at all. Um, if you're interested in exploring, um, this isn't the only. There's lots of artwork from this time that is really all about the plants and Martin Rudwick's work um, in Scenes from Deep Time but, but he has a more recent book too which, which absolutely talks about the representation of, 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 of past snapshots of time and um, so I would revisit that but just to say that there was <laughs> I'm not the sort of person who says there was a golden age and we should go back to it however in terms of representations of paleobotany and making that very clear link between plants now and plants in the past. The second half of the 19th century was pretty good, actually. And it's not just so this, in my view, is the 19th century um, equivalent to Jurassic Park. And it's all about the plants. It's not entirely about the plants, actually. It's a bit of a lie, but it's very plant focused. Bit of Grange is a house. Um, in Cheshire and it was built by a man who made money out of coal and he wanted to tell he was called um, James Bateman he wanted to tell the story that I wish to tell but from a very different perspective he wanted to tell the story of life through time in terms of um, biblical creation so he had this geological gallery built um, next to his house. He embedded fossils by day of creation in the walls. Um, uh, Nigel Larkin has been doing amazing work and then these pictures are from before he did his restoration. I, I should point out this was the last time I was able to go about two years ago, it's probably three years ago, um, whilst he was still doing that work. Um, but it's using the fossils as objects. Yes, it's a very different take on explaining that history of life through time. Um, but it, it's, it was there, it, it was open to the public. It was for people to come and understand the story of life through time. Um, we can find ways of communicating this story um, that, that, that will get that story across. Okay. And the Victorians seem to have made that link really successfully. So I've unpacked a whole bunch of stuff there about um, how we represent um, paleobotany and plant evolution. Um, 
and today we we are sort of it's it, in the past um we have good examples of how it was done well so can we improve how people perceive plants in paleontology and how we communicate that to people i would argue we can and thinking about um basically what are our best hooks what are mine so one of the things that i, I used to do um back in the day when the guardian had um science blogs and i wrote um i, I was basically um in charge of writing about the fossil plants for the, the paleontology blog um, I had to find hooks, I had to find ways of getting across um, a story about plant evolution. And once a month or so, I made it my mission to make sure that we talked about plants. Um, what hooks can we use? Um, because we know that the deficit model, which I, I hope we're going to talk about a little bit um, when we discuss everything, doesn't work. You, you can't just tell people something and hope that they are interested to learn it. Most people don't work like that. Uh, we have to find hooks we have to find ways in so in my view um we have several strong ways in several hooks we can use um one of the strongest is if you remember i talked about that story of resilience and that story of plant life over that big big time scale um there are plenty of plants around today um who are survivors through deep time and some of them are the last ragged one species left of a once mighty group things like um, Wollemia there the one of my pine and ginkgo biloba um, and sequoia dendron all of these um, trees that, that are the last representatives of big mesozoic groups but you've also got um, things like um, you know if we're talking about bryophytes or all the, the spore producing um, tracheophytes as well you've got you've got plant groups that yes they've carried on evolving i'm not saying that they, they, they're in some sort of stasis from when they first evolve but but there's plant diversity out there and connecting people with that and making them realize that that biodiversity you know look beyond the angiosperms and see what's there that can be a really strong hook again to bring animals back into the mix because I don't think we can talk about um, um, ecosystems and we can't uh, we can't um, divorce ourselves it, it, it's it's silly to think that we mustn't talk about animals as well talking about plants and animals in evolutionary partnerships is a really strong way of getting people's interest um, Conrad's lab Bandiera and his lab have done some lovely work about um, they're just there as an example about um, plant animal interactions in the past and being able to talk about things like the fact that so this calligrammated lacewing this is not a butterfly this is a lacewing from the jurassic and it's not on a flower it's on um, an extinct group of plants these are the benetites um, and, and also ran um, group of, of, of seed plants from the mesozoic um, so being able to say that you have animals that look and behaved like butterflies but weren't butterflies, um, pollinating plants that are quite similar to flowering plants but also different, being able to, 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 to make those um, comparisons um, is a powerful way of communicating about plants through deep time. Crashing on. <laughs> um, also talking about what we can see, I talked briefly about those, those preservations where we can see cellular detail. Um, nice examples there. Um, being able to make those links. So, so Evo Devo has been really important in animal biology, being able to draw those links um, in uh, plants. Plant Evo Devo is a strong move. Finally, and most importantly, I think that the environmental story, the climate change story, being able to say that plant fossils can tell us if we look at the, so you've got fossil stomata there preserved on fossil cuticle. Um, we can say things about changes in CO2 levels through deep time because of these plant fossils. Um, and that links us back to engaging with people. Um, climate change is no bigger issue at the moment um, being able to tie in that history of deep time 
with climate change. Um, I think that's a really salient and important hook. So we need to strike a balance um, and work with our, our colleagues who help us to reconstruct the past um, to represent the plants. Um, and that can be done really successfully. People like Mark Witten actually do try really hard. He's like the, the paleo artist, paleo artist. Um, so there are people who are doing this good work out there, um, helping us to tell our stories about plants through deep time. Um, and finally, just to end on, on what I think is a really, really nice paleo reconstruction, see if you can spot the animal. Um, and with that, thank you for listening. <laughs>